All right. So I'd like to introduce Makun. Um, Makun is actually also a doctor, although not a medical doctor. Um, prior to his now career in the nonprofit and volunteer world, he had a 40-year career in the aerospace industry as a, a researcher, a scientist, professor, um, traveling across three continents. And when he ended that career, his passion for serious illness and um, palliative and hospice care led him to co-found the organization Sukum with a couple other dedicated volunteers. Sukum is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advocate for and promote healthy aging, living well, and preparing for life's transitions among the San Francisco Bay Area's growing South Asian population. McCoon also volunteers in a number of different capacities and we're so blessed to have him at Stanford Hospital and Stanford Medicine. He is a member of the Cancer Center Palliative Care Design Team. He's also an active member of our Patient and Family Partner Program on a number of committees there. He's also a volunteer with our Spiritual Services Program, um, bringing advanced care planning and support to uh, patients and caregivers and their families. And um, pre-COVID, he would teach uh, fall prevention and balance class in the community. And he's also a volunteer and community ambassador with Mission um, Hospice and Home Health in San Mateo. And I think some of his fellow volunteers are on this uh, presentation today. So hello to Mission. And McCoon, we just wanted to thank you so, so much for um, co-hosting and helping us organize this. We're really blessed to have you. And with that, I'll let uh, McCoon take it away. So thank you, Claire, for that very generous introduction. I too would like to add my welcome to all of you to this seminar. I'm very happy you were able to join us. Sukham is very pleased to partner with Stanford to bring you today's discussion. There's a real need for our community to be better informed on this topic. I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker, Dr. Kavita Ramachandran. She's a clinical associate professor at the Stanford School of Medicine and is a practicing thoracic oncologist and palliative care physician at the Stanford Cancer Center. She completed her education and training at Stanford, UCSF and Northwestern University before returning to join the faculty at Stanford in 2010. We are really fortunate to have Kavita speak to us today. She has led a multidisciplinary team at Stanford for more than five years now to develop an approach to integrate palliative care into the treatment for patients at the Stanford Cancer Center. She is a medical director that currently oversees the system, which is focused on improving the quality of life experience for, pan for patients with a cancer diagnosis. Kavita is also recognized nationally and internationally for her role in education and research in both, in both cancer and palliative care. And on a personal note, I'm also privileged to say that Kavita is a good friend. Could I have the next slide, please, Kavita? Okay, so this is a roadmap for our presentation and discussion today. Before I hand it off to Dr. Ramchandran, I want to spend five or six minutes to tell you why it's important for all of us of South Asian and, or Indian origin to understand palliative care and why academic medical centers like Stanford are interested in bringing this message to us South Asians. Many of you will be familiar with some of what I have to say, but I think it's important for all of us to understand this perspective in the context of today's talk. I will begin with some statistics. According to the 2010 US Census, 15 to 20% of South Asian population lives in California. It's estimated that 10 or 15% of the San Francisco Bay Area population, which was around 7 million in 2010, is South Asian. Now with the surge of immigration in the past decade, these numbers have grown significantly and about a million people of South Asian descent now reside here in the Bay Area. These percentages are representative of many regions around the US. A recent study pre predicts that by 2065, Asian Americans will be the largest immigrant group in the US, and that would be driven primarily by growth in the South Asian population, about 80% of which are of Indian origin. 
So you can see we are a sizable portion of the community and centers like Stanford want to get to know us better so that they can provide improved, more personalized care for us. If you take a look at the million or so South Asians living in the Bay Area now, we are a diverse, multi-ethnic and multi-religious group. We speak many different languages and cover a wide spectrum of professional and economic status. Some of us have integrated into mainstream society better than others. Some in our group struggle with the local language norms and customs. Many have been here for decades while others are relatively recent immigrants. Within this group, we have a large and growing number of people who are facing age-related related issues, serious and chronic illness, incapacity, facing elder care responsibilities, and death and bereavement. So we are a diverse bunch, but we do share deeply rooted culture, traditions, and values that can impact our ability to handle serious and chronic illness. We typically don't share personal issues with anyone except family. Talk of death and dying is generally taboo. Most of us avoid these topics until forced to by a life disrupting event. So as a result, we are often ill-prepared to deal with these crises. This is the primary reason that Sukhum came into being we saw a pressing need for culturally sensitive education and guidance that advocated healthy living and aging well, but also being well prepared for life's transitions. We saw the need to provide sensitive support when such disruptions do occur. Most people of the, in the community that I've talked to either don't know about palliative care, don't understand it fully, or misunderstand what it is. By the way, that lack of a good understanding is not unique to us South Asians. A lot of people I have talked to connect the term palliative care with end of life. That is not the case as you will see shortly. Also the approach many of us have when dealing with serious illness or making decisions about medical treatment and interacting with doctors and physicians is influenced by our culture, our traditions, and upbringing. Several studies have shown that Indians and South Asians are often ill-prepared and traumatized when thrust into diffi making difficult medical decisions. Families are reluctant to talk about such topics. Children try to protect parents and parents try to protect children. Even today, some families have a hierarchy of decision makers usually beginning with the oldest son who serves as the primary contact and disseminator of information. Families may be reluctant to discuss personal and emotional issues with healthcare providers because these are considered very private and traditionally not shared with anyone other than those in the immediate household. And this can be a roadblock for those who want to provide effective palliative care. There have been a couple of instances in my own extended family where they did not inform the patient of his or her cancer diagnosis because they did not want the loved one to be distressed. Some of us see doctors and physicians as authority figures and are reluctant to ask questions for fear of offending them. And then there's the Hindu belief of karma that sometimes plays a role in driving attitudes and behaviors towards serious illness. This belief in the law of behavior and consequences in which actions of our past life affect the circumstances which one is born into and lives in this life. You know, we tend to say, this is our karma, there's not much we can do about it. So come is pushing to change all this. We feel we need to be informed, engaged and prepared. A physician friend of mine has a very good analogy. She says, Having a fire extinguisher at home doesn't mean that you will burn your house down. It just means that you are better prepared. You know what to do when the time comes and you have the tools to do it. So we're hoping to give you some of those tools today. I'd like to ask Dr. Ramchandran to take over now. Kavita? 
Oh, Clinton, that was so beautiful. Thank you. Um, and thank you for setting the context so nicely for all of us. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you guys throw a thumbs up? Awesome. Okay. So I um, wish I could be in the same room with you all. I uh, am used to doing these talks in person, um, but it's uh, my privilege and pleasure to at least be able to see you all in the comforts of your home. Um, and I'm thankful that you made the time to join us today. Uh, normally I would start right now by asking everyone um, to define palliative care. Uh, because I think the words palliative care invoke quite a bit of confusion. Um, and for some people, um, many people don't even know what it is. Um, I'm curious, uh, Claire, if I asked people to write things in the chat box, would that be okay? Yeah, sure. So if you don't mind, uh, just a few brave souls, um, uh, if you don't mind defining uh, palliative care for me um, in the chat box, uh, and at the end, we'll have a little bit more time for conversation as well, but take a second. And Claire, I think I have a view where I just have the big screen, so I might ask you to... Sure, I can read them out when we get some. Okay. Images. Don't see any yet. No one wants to take a stab. <laughs> oh, here we go. Managing pain for a comfortable life. Wonderful. Other thoughts? I see palliative care as an extra layer of support for patients and families and as a way to manage symptoms. How to handle severe disease. I love all of those. So managing pain, an extra layer of support, handling severe disease. I think I can step down and have a couple of you join me up here to, to give this talk. Um, so you're right. Uh, and many of you, um, I might ask for the next thing in the chat box, which is, um, have any of you encountered palliative care, either for yourself or for someone you love. And I'll talk while you guys uh, enter that in and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more. So there are many definitions of, of palliative care. And when I think about palliative care, I think about it as holistic care and really think about it as care that is meant to really take into account your values, your goals, your agenda. And I love being a palliative care doctor because it's the first time when I can walk into a room with someone and say to someone, what's on your mind? How can I help you today? And that's all I'm really there to do. I don't have a set of labs I'm looking at or 15 scan reports or three different things on my agenda that I need to get done, but I really want There's an echo. Um, but what I'm looking for is trying to understand what is most valuable to you in that moment. And it also means that I'm interested in how that might change over time. Meaning that what you might tell me today is gonna look different than what you tell me six months from now. But the goal is that in that time, I've used that time to get to know you better. I've used that time to understand who you are what is important to you? What does your family look like? What do you do in your free time? How do you get relief from stress? What are the things that stress you out? And I use that time so that I understand when you're handling medical illness, how can I support you best? And how can I figure out what are the things that are gonna be meaningful for you as we embark on a medical plan of care as well? So, I'm thinking about this when I see you in clinic with the goal of trying to figure out as you approach serious illness, how can we prioritize your values and goals above all else? And how can we make sure that those, those things that are of such importance to you get communicated not only to me, but also across a very complex healthcare team? 
So here we define it as palliative care is specialized health care for people living with serious illness. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of serious illness. That the care is uh, focused on providing relief from symptoms and stress of the illness. And the goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. And Mukund did a really nice job um, setting up the South Asian context. I am quite proud to be brown. I'm sure many of you are as well. Um, we come from a very strong heritage, a heritage that's proud, very old in its roots, very thoughtful in how we think about ourselves, not only in terms of ourselves as individuals, but how we're connected to our families, to our communities, and to nature. And so I think that understanding that is so important as we provide that care. So how is palliative care, how do you experience palliative care? Um, that's also somewhat unique. And I think for many folks, um, first of all, I'm gonna ask Claire, did anyone respond if they've actually encountered palliative care? Yeah, we had a few. Um, someone said their husband has advanced Parkinson's and another's mother suffers with rheumatoid arthritis and it's a constant battle fighting pain. Hmm. I um, really appreciate both of the willingness of both of those participants to tell us a little bit more. Um, and I think that those are actually really um, nice examples for folks who would benefit from having palliative care integrated into their care teams. Um, and I'm curious um, by maybe a show of hands or if any of you have actually met a palliative care team. Maybe a hand raise if you have. Let's see one or two raised hands. Yeah, yeah. okay. So it's, um, a palliative care team is a little bit different uh, from your average medical team. First of all, it's a team that is trained um, with additional specialty training in symptom management and looking at psychosocial needs and existential and spiritual needs. Um, the goal is really to provide I think someone said this at the beginning, so I'm so proud, an extra layer of support. So this idea of providing this additional um, layer of support for patients who have um, needs that could impact their quality of life as a result of their illness. And it's based on, um, it can be provided at any point in the trajectory of illness. So the idea is that it's not something that you, you know, only would encounter when you are, um, you know, close to end of life, or only would encounter if you felt like you were given a diagnosis of an incurable illness. But really, it's something that we think is meant to improve the quality of your life and your function um, at any point throughout the trajectory of your illness. So what does living with serious illness mean? I heard a couple of common diagnoses and um, rheumatoid arthritis and Parkinson's are definitely some of those. Um, other serious illness, Ill illnesses that you might think would benefit from palliative care. You can use the chat box. Cancer, we're getting a lot of cancer. All types of dementia, cancer. <laughs> Perfect. So I know this is not a fun topic, but we will all unfortunately pass away at some point. I think would be the distance. And it's, um, some of us have the ability to know that they will have an illness that will lead to their, to shortening, the, shortening their life. Other of us, others of us won't we may never have that opportunity to know what may shorten our life. But we all know that we will pass away. And so any life limiting illness, anyone with a change in function over time would benefit from a palliative care approach. Cancer comes up often and cancer is scary. I'm an oncologist too. 
So I get that. Um, and, but cancer is just one of many. The others that we all are living with, um, heart failure, a lot of South Asian folks, we have the South Asian Heart Center at Stanford, uh, handle heart disease and the consequences of heart disease, um, liver, kidney, or lung disease, um, dementia was brought up, ALS, Parkinson's disease. These are all common reasons that you may seek a palliative care provider out. Um, rheumatoid disease as well, rheuma, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, as you pointed out. Um, I really think about any disease that affects your quality of your life, your ability to function, your identity, how you see yourself. If you walk from the line of healthy to sick, if you go from feeling well to having your identity being affected by your illness, that is a time when palliative care can be of help. Um, diagnoses that are probably less well served, although I have some, I'll put a question mark by diabetes, um, just because uh, I think some of the consequences of long term diabetes can be incredibly challenging um, peripheral neuropathy, vision problems kidney disease. Um, but, you know, your average person with chronic diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, these very um, consistent diagnoses for patients who are South Asian origin, often don't really affect our quality of life, um, or function in a way that we necessarily think having an extra layer of support through palliative care um, is necessary. And this is an interesting one. Um, a lot of people have chronic pain and that's like a whole nother topic. I'll leave that for another day. But chronic pain that is not from a serious illness, maybe an injury like a uh, trauma, like fall, or um, is something that we usually have you um, see a pain specialist rather than a palliative care doctor. Cause they're really just having that razor sharp um, view towards pain, um, and they have a multidisciplinary team that can help with pain that's ongoing. So what are the things that palliative care can help with? So this is a very short list of all of the things that we do because we do so much more. Um, but remember when I said, when you walk into the room, I ask you what's on your mind, that's what we take care of. So it is basically, anything that you could possibly want from a physician psychosocial care team when it comes to helping handle your illness in a way to make things better for you. So for some folks, it's pain or neuropathy or fatigue. For a lot though, it's this concept of coping with serious illness because coping is a longitudinal process. And what they've looked at when they've looked at studies of palliative care is that they found that we help people cope. We give people the tools to work with what they're given, which no one wants a serious illness, it's very difficult, but we give people the tools to deal with what they're given so that they can live the best life possible, even in the context of challenging information or a challenging diagnosis. And though that looks like different things at different times, sometimes it's a medication for depression, sometimes it's just a little bit of talk therapy, sometimes it's helping with financial planning or psychosocial needs, sometimes it's working with kids who are having challenges at school or dealing with the fact that their parents aren't the people that they once were. Sometimes it's helping them have a bowel movement because constipation sucks. And so it's really about figuring out where that patient is, what's really impacting their ability to have the best life they can in the context of a hard diagnosis, and how can we make baby steps to make that better? And, and, and that commitment, that sense of commitment to that patient and that family throughout that care trajectory, um, throughout all of these different components. And then, one of the things that's um, put here at the end, but that's so important is this idea of caregiving. We're a unit. Many of us don't live in isolation. 
um, we either have family members or we have friends or we have co co um, co-workers, but we often have someone with us um, and that is experiencing illness with us. And that person has a different perspective, but is also going through their own journey. So we spend a lot of time talking with patients and families about what it means to be a caregiver as well, and what it means to take care of a patient who is um, sick. So, um, you know, this is a really, really important part of um, palliative care. And I think, you know, one of the things that, an analogy that someone made for me once was, you can hit the golf ball, but make sure you're hitting the golf ball in the right direction. And so part of what we do in palliative care is know the direction that we need to hit the golf ball. Um, and otherwise things happen to you without you really having a say in um, whether that's the right thing for you or for your family. And medicine has changed too. Um, medicine used to be a lot about um, caring and a little bit more about symptom management than it is today. We're in a really exciting phase of medicine where we have lots of drugs, lots of treatments, lots of interventions. And so we can do a lot to you. We're very good at doing things to you. We're very good at putting in a ventricular assist de di um, device or starting dialysis or putting an epidural into someone's back or starting chemotherapy. But we don't always know if what we're doing is in line with what you want. And I think what we spend time with in palliative care is understanding that all that time I said about knowing who you are, what's important to you, how you spend your weekends, who are the people that give you joy, all of that time is spent for the purpose of knowing what really matters to you most and how can we make sure that that gets incorporated when we're thinking about doing things to you. So if someone uh, said to me, you know, I know I have metastatic pancreatic cancer um, and I know that these chemotherapy drugs won't help me for very long, but my daughter is getting married in June and I'd really like to be at that wedding. Then I'll say, okay, so that means that we're gonna give you these chemotherapy drugs with the goal of keeping you strong and well enough so you can go to that wedding in June. If someone said, you know, I know I'm gonna to have to deal with rheumatoid arthritis for the rest of my life and the pain is super debilitating, but I need to function well enough to still volunteer in my child's classroom. So I can't be sleepy and I can't be out of it. Then we think, okay, what are the types of medicines that we, I can give you that you can take and still be an active volunteer in your daughter's school, but function well enough, even if it means you have a little more pain but you can do the things that you set out to do. And the other piece of this is knowing that we are not working in isolation. And so now that I know you, do I know that the people around you know you as well as you want to be known? So this is a very interesting thing, especially in families. We often think that the people that know us and love us know everything about what we want, but that's not always true. Um, as your palliative care doctor, I might know more about you than your husband or your wife or your daughter because you might be revealing things to me about your illness and about what you want that may not be as easy to communicate to someone you love. And so we spend some time really thinking about information transfer, disclosure, what it means to be able to pass that very difficult information about your goals and wishes to someone you love? And how does that information transfer look? And what do you want your loved ones to know? And what, with what they know, how do you want them to support you? And those are really important conversations. And we often facilitate those kinds of conversations with patients and families so that they can feel like they've communicated what they need to, to the people that they love. And I don't do this by myself. <laughs> I wish, um, that's part of the reason I love palliative care. Um, it's a team approach because I do a part of it. And then there's these amazing people that I work with um, that make doing what I do possible. 
Um, so we have social workers. Can you all hear Kavita? Sorry, I can't hear her. They go on mute. Okay, there we go. <laughs> we, I think we, we left off with we have social workers. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sometimes it auto mutes. Um, thank you, uh, Claire. So yes, yeah, so we have these amazing team members, social workers, chaplains, child life specialists, um, who are really there to think about what we call the four quadrants of care, which is the physical symptoms, the psychological symptoms, the social ramifications, and the existential ramifications of illness. Because we know that when you get diagnosed with a serious illness, it affects all of that. It affects your own concept of identity. It affects your feelings around um, your relationship with God. It affects your ability to work or your ability to be a parent. So it's not just about having cancer. It's about how cancer has affected every other component of who you are and how it's affected how people see you. And so for that reason, we have these other folks whose main job, sorry, um, is to ensure that you get the care that you need. And that includes emotional support, caregiver support, managing equipment, like how can I get a wheelchair so I can move from point A to point B, financial toxicity. Our healthcare system is quite broken. Um, we have a very challenging time with illness and we do not necessarily understand the full impact of illness on people's social and financial lives. Um, but it's devastating to end up with a serious illness at a time when, it, it, when other things are not a given, such as work. And so um, thinking about how we can also support you through financial issues or financial concerns is also super important. And I think the other piece of this is really kind of the existential piece. Um, I think illness is um, one of those spaces where people can feel really isolated. Um, a lot of folks don't know how to support you when you have illness. A lot of folks don't know what to say. Um, and a lot of times you feel like if you, do, if you are religious or spiritual that God has abandoned you. And I think um, having a chaplain or a religious support group or a spiritual partner to kind of think through some of those existential worries or needs is super important. Um, we also have a lot of young folks and grandparents who um, are super actively involved in their kids' lives or grandkids' lives. Um, and kids are lost when illness hits. And so whether they're three years old or 19, but really they're more like 13, um, somewhere in that age group, there are kids who are saying, what do I do now? You know, my life has been turned upside down. So we work with Lucille Packard, actually, and we have a really great child life program um, that helps us to support children um, of uh, families who have serious illness, illness, whether that's a parent or a grandparent. Um, so this talks a little bit about the team-based approach, and we'll, I think, um, you are getting the idea that we're this extra layer of support. Um, and so I think just to reiterate um, that we're really here at any age and we're really here to see anyone alongst any part of their trajectory of illness. So for example, um, I see patients with new diagnoses of serious illness. I see patients that are cured, but with ongoing symptoms. Um, I see patients who are pursuing curative therapy, um, patients who are pursuing treatments that we can't necessarily cure them, but we're trying to prolong their life. Um, I also see patients who are um, living with illness, um, but are just not receiving active therapy for it, which we call disease modifying therapy. So the goal here really is um, to meet people where they're at. It's funny, sometimes, um, I've been in practice at Stanford for about a decade. And I started the palliative care clinic about seven years ago. I still see some of my patients um, from seven years ago. And they sometimes say, Dr. Ramachandran, um, when are you gonna tell me that I've graduated from your clinic? And I'll say, when you tell me, um, because I really, it's really for you. If you feel like you're benefiting from 
seeing me and getting that continued support and that symptom management and that layer of um, that insight into kind of uh, someone who's always paying attention to what you think is important in your medical care, then please keep coming. And I enjoy seeing you. So it's just, um, it's a nice relationship over time. And I've walked people through stem cell transplants and walked patients through chronic um, issues with arthritis or Parkinson's. And um, it's been a blessing on my end to be able to, to walk with them through those different parts of their journeys. Um, and so why do we care so much about palliative care? Um, <laughs> I love the title of this slide. <laughs> if we're, we're a pill, it would be worth millions. Um, Claire, thank you. Uh, so I, you know, I think um, this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, if you're a scientist or a, uh, if you're an oncologist, you look at these all the time and you want to see spread. You want to see these curves spread. Um, it means that there's value when there's a spread. If you look at Many of the oncology drugs, the spread is very small. You'd have to kind of look at them and be like, wait, is there an improvement? But when you look at this, this is a pretty big spread. And what does this mean? It means that if you actually get palliative care from a specialized team on a regular basis for a chronic illness, you do better. You live longer, you feel better, you do better. And so this study was done by a friend of mine in Boston. Um, and she did this landmark study in lung cancer, and she showed that you live longer if you get palliative care. The study has since been reproduced multiple times over by a variety of different colleagues in Canada and the United States. And all of them have shown that not only do you um, improve survival, which this study did, you improve quality of life and you improve caregiver burden. So people feel better, they live longer, and the people who are affected by illness feel better too. So there's really no downside. Um, and I thank um, Jennifer for doing this study because she put us on the, on the roadmap to saying, you should have us involved. We are as effective as powerful medicines like Rituxan for lymphoma. Um, so, these are some of the things that we just talked about. And I think the final thing that's so important about this is that um, by doing care that's concordant with your goals, meaning knowing you, we probably improve the quality of care at the end of life. So I haven't talked much about end of life because I don't think palliative care has anything to do with end of life. It has to do with quality of life, but if you actually pay attention to quality of life and you pay attention to goals, then you're probably going to improve end of life because you will keep patients holding to the things that are most important to them, which is usually being with their family, staying at home, and enjoying pat like passing that legacy on in the ways that are right for them. So Palliative care, if you do it early for patients who do have serious illness, has resulted in fewer hospitalizations, less fewer hospital days, and less time in intensive care at the end of life. So that's also an important point. Um, so this is a, a beautiful article in the New York Times, and actually many people have written about palliative care. I think um, the other story I love to say is in patients, first come to see me, they often cancel their appointment, usually not just once, sometimes twice. And it's usually like maybe the third time they come and they're like, I was a little scared to see you. And I was like, what? And they're like, I thought you were going to talk about death. And I was like, no. And then they were like, and then I thought you were going to talk about hospice. And I was like, no. And then you didn't talk about any of that. And I was like, yes. And they were like, it was nice to see you. I was like, uh-huh. And so, and they actually are like, I wish I saw you earlier. I was like, I did, I do too. Um, and it's just, I had this beautiful patient just recently, breast cancer, 13 years into her diagnosis, totally curable. But she said, my life has been miserable with pain and with neuropathy and lymphedema. And there was no one who actually cared that much about my experience of my illness. And um, 
she wishes that she came earlier. She's glad she's there now. So most folks feel like they do have some fear about coming, but once they land there, they're, they're glad. Um, and I think this story uh, just highlights the fact that we do care about everything that you bring to us and we're glad you brought it up and we're happy to, to help you get through that. Um, and we're also happy to talk about the stuff that no one else wants to talk about, like bowel movements and vomiting, which honestly is suffering, but we, we want to, we want to know. Um, and this is kind of this whole idea of kind of remembering where we are in this palliative care is for everyone. Um, hospice is one component of care. Um, does anyone know what hospice is? And you can use your chat box to say what it is. Comfort focused care towards the end of life. So somebody. You guys are on it. <laughs> Others? Care for terminally ill patients. When all treatment options have been exhausted. I love those. I, I love those um, suggestions. So Hospice care is a philosophy of care. It is related to palliative care, but different. Um, it's meant for people whose goals are in alignment with comfort and quality of life and who are not as engaged with disease modifying therapy. So I use the word disease modifying therapy a lot because you can get excellent supportive care and symptom management and be on hospice. And you don't have to give up a lot of other things, but you have to say that you no longer want disease modifying therapy. So for a cancer patient, that might be you don't want chemo anymore, but you don't have to be at the end of life to access hospice. And I think a lot of folks feel like I have to be on my last days. In fact, no, I would actually say that if you have a life limiting illness and you're interested in care that really promotes symptom management and quality of life, and that is your primary goal, you don't wanna run in back and forth from the doctor's appointments, you don't wanna keep in going to the emergency rooms, you don't wanna be in the ICU, you wanna be at home with your family, then hospice is a very reasonable choice. And hospice, is technically for patients with a prognosis of six months or less. I can tell you right now that most people are in hospice for much less than that because everyone's so afraid to go on hospice that they're only on hospice for two weeks or two days or two months at the most. So I would say if you do have a loved one who has a serious illness and their goals are comfort and quality of life and their prognosis is somewhere around six months, consider it, it's a good option. Um, I think the other thing to remember about hospice is that you do, if you're over 65, Medicare will cover it. But if you're under 65 and we see a lot of young folks, you do need to look into your insurance to make sure that hospice is a covered benefit. And that's an important discussion to have. But many of our hospices do offer pro bono um, care because they're amazing like that. Um, and we can open it up at the end for any questions about hospice but hospice is not palliative care. Palliative care is not hospice, um, but we are very thankful for each other. Um, and I am very thankful for everything that hospice has to provide for our patients who need it. Um, and so this is uh, our really amazing team. Um, we have a really great group of folks at uh, Stanford who you see here. We also have network providers now, both at in the San Jose area as well as it's in Emeryville. Um, and we also have inpatient providers that are in the hospital. Um, and so we are here for you. Um, there's this a website here that can tell you how you can access us um, and how you can make appointments. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Claire and McCoon um, to see if there's any questions and uh, if McClune wanted to add anything else from Stukum's end. Thank you so much, Kavita, for that lovely, lively talk about palliative care. It's a serious subject that, as you say, patient, people tend to 
not want to hear about, but when they he do hear about it, they're pleasantly surprised as to what it can offer. I just wanted to add one thing to what Kavita just said about this particular slide. Um, the, uh, we'll ask Claire later on to send out a post uh, um, seminar email follow up to everyone who registered and we'll give you these links, but, uh, and, and as Kavita recommends, contact the Stanford Palliative Care team directly and, and get your questions answered, get appointments made if, for, for family if you need to. Um, the other thing I do have to offer is if you go to the Sukham website, uh, sukham.org, uh, you'll find a contact us button there. And if you would like, if you're perhaps not in the area or if you have some other questions that you prefer someone else take care of or you want, you're just looking for additional information, um, put, put, type your question into the chat box or, or contact the, or us by email. The email address is also there and we'll provide all of this information to you. And I will make it a point personally to get back to everyone who reaches out and see if we can help you sort out your questions one-on-one. On, one on one. Our website also does provide, as does the Stanford Palliative Care website, additional information about palliative care and hospice care and, and so on and so forth. So uh, do feel free to, to reach out to us. You might have uh, answer questions that arise afterwards uh, that may not occur to you right now. Uh, Kavita, one question I did see popping up when you were talking about palliative care a couple of times uh, was you talked about insurance and hospice care. There's also a question about um, does insurance cover palliative care? So do you yes. want to talk to that? Yeah, insurance will cover palliative care. So um, it goes through the normal authorization process or whatever your HMO or PPO will go through, but we um, offer, it's relative, most people will get palliative care covered. Um, and if you're part of a Kaiser system, most Kaisers now have palliative care. Um, if you're part of a Sutter system, um, most Sutters also have palliative care. Uh, and then as of course Stanford, uh, if you have access to the Stanford Healthcare Network, um, you can access myself or one of my amazing colleagues. I saw and, a question pop up well. about. Uh, saw a question Sorry. pop up about uh, in, uh, what about palliative care in Michigan, um, and uh, if you follow up and 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 check with me later on, I can help you find that information for you. However, in any any state, if you look for the one of the university uh, 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 hospitals, what we call the academic research centers, where you have medical, uh, a, a medical school associated with a hospital, that's a good, typically a good starting point where you will get information on palliative care, but we can help you get specific information too. Sorry, Claire, I didn't, didn't mean oh, to talk that's okay. about you. I was going to say, if you advance the slide, there should be one more um, slide and it, it has this um, getpalliativecare.org is a palliative provider directory. So if you're looking in Michigan, uh, I think you can put in your zip code and they can help you find some providers that way too. That's a national um, directory. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Makund. Um, yes, and Medicare is, does cover- You can also uh, always ask your primary care. And you can ask your primary care provider wherever you're at if you want a referral to palliative care as well. Great. It looks like we have a question about um, it can sometimes be that what the patient wants is different from what the family wants, like you were talking about earlier. So what then, and how does a palliative care team help? That is the a, a really good reason to see a palliative care provider um, because often there's differences of opinion on what people want. Um, often there's also differences of opinion on what is actually available medically. Um, and so, I would recommend a consultation, especially if patients and families disagree. Um, you know, I'm gonna say, you know, brown families, I'm just gonna gen generalize a little here. We tend to make decisions together. Um, we don't really like to make people feel um, like we're just doing it by ourselves. 
Um, so you have to kind of bring everyone along. Um, but I would say what would make life easier is if you could designate one person. So you're the person who's sick. You des designate one other person that is going to be kind of your go-to person that is going to help you to communicate your love, your wishes to everyone else um, so that you're a team. Uh, because otherwise it's a bit like herding cats. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone has a voice. Um, but if you can designate one person to be kind of your um, your your voice when your voice may get weak or you might just get tired out of trying to explain yourself over and over again. But that time to have that one person makes a huge difference. It also helps the medical teams because when you have a group of six people coming at you and they're all saying really well-meaning things, then sometimes we get confused. The doctors get confused. Um, but if you have the person and then you have one person helping, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I was just gonna add to that Kavita, that's so true that one, one of the, I guess, social cult cultural idiosyncrasies of, of a lot of our families is that sometimes there's a tendency for one person in the family to decide what's best for you and not really leave that choice up to you who is the patient sometimes. And, and, and I've seen a couple of instances where uh, that has created some, um, I guess, unhappiness or tension, so. And that's so important, Mukun, because fundamentally part of the reason I like to see people for a while in palliative care is I really wanna to get to know my patient. Like that's the person I have the onus to take care of. And so if there is a lot of difference and I'm like, wait, what this family member is saying seems very different from what you've said to me over the last two years. Can we talk about that? Because something's not gelling here. Um, so it's really important um, to Makun's point that someone is looking out for the patient's wishes, which is really the most important thing. Um, and that can be a palliative care provider or it can be that one family person as well. Thank you both. There's a question and it kind of goes to someone else's question. Um, for patients with dementia um, who might not be able to decide or verbalize for themselves, like if they want palliative care, who decides that? And then somebody had asked kind of about like, how do you, who qualifies this like qualify for palliative care question. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about when people could or should or want, want to use palliative care. So I think dementia um, is a great uh, opportunity to meet palliative care early. Um, I do feel like it's a very um, challenging diagnosis um, and there's ebbs and flows with it that are very hard to predict. Um, so I would say that if you have a loved one with dementia or you have dementia, that it's very reasonable for you to reach out and make an appointment to see us. Um, I think in terms of the uh, decision-making around dementia, that's also another good reason to see us because we recommend doing something called an advanced directive um, or a living will early in a dementia diagnosis or prior to getting dementia because we want to still take care of you, the patient, right? Like the goal always is to understand the patient's goals and wishes. And so before dementia becomes too serious, we want to be able to document all of that as clearly as possible. And doing that through an advanced directive, using the resources here, talk, going through Sukkum to help get some resources there, to help do that advanced care planning early is critical. Um, if that boat has passed and the dementia is too severe to make um, those decisions, then I would say that usually it falls to um, the spouse or whoever's named in the advanced directive to make decisions on behalf of the patient. But all the more reason at that point to consider having support either through a primary care provider, a geriatrician, um, McCoon's program or palliative care. There, it can come in many different ways, but getting some support because there's a huge burden as a caregiver when you're trying to take care of someone who's sick and you feel like you're making decisions for them and that can come with some guilt and some worry. And so having someone else to just kind of bounce ideas off of and talk through what's right 
um, is good. And just as a follow up and a commercial for uh, Stanford and Sukhum Kavita, uh, for, if people are interested in uh, advanced care planning and hearing more about that more details, um, uh, Claire's uh, leads out an effort on uh, uh, webinars around advanced care planning and Sukham does as well and Mission Hospice does as well. So there are a lot of sources. So give us feedback and if there's enough interest, we can uh, perhaps in a, a while do a, a similar webinar on uh, advanced care planning that people might be interested in. Yes, I can send that. We have some um, recurring quarterly advanced care planning workshops. So I can send that out in an email. Dr. Ramchandran, I know you have to go at, at four. Um, so I, I think we might need to wrap up now, um, but I just wanted to thank you and Makun so, so much for such a clarifying, beautiful session um, and all the examples given. I also wanna thank, I know he's on here, Dr. Grant Smith for his support in the preparation of this. That was his, um, if this pill was worth, it would be worth millions. That wasn't me, can't take credit for that. Um, and I'm apologies if we didn't get to your questions, but please do um, use our website or Sukum's website to submit them to us via email if um, that works for you. And um, we hope that you'll join us for future webinars and workshops um, as well. Thank you all. We enjoyed having all of you and uh, hope to see you back uh, at future events. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.